So, of course, over the past week, I've been working on moving states uh, to get ready for school and moving in with some people. Now that I begin to settle, I'll show you what I've been working with. Uh, my original setup, just while I was getting unpacked, it was really not the best at all. Um, and so I kind of had to go through the process of acquiring a new desk and uh, getting that all set up properly. So I spent the last day just throwing that together and getting that all set up so I can actually start working now. In the meantime, I've been working on optimizing my game for performance. It's really easy to get a mobile game to run at 30 frames per second in Unity um, pretty consistently. Getting above 30 is really difficult. You basically can't have any memory leaks and any post-processing is extremely heavy on a mobile device. You have to be extremely deliberate with your textures and any sounds that you import in order to just eke out that extra little bit of performance. The refresh rate on mobile devices is generally set to just 30 frames per second or 60 and it's discrete. So if your game drops below 60 frames at any point, it immediately, uh, the phone drops that frame entirely down to 30 frames per second. And so this causes this jittering effect when there's uh, any sort of buffers in the uh, rendering. In order to have a really smooth gaming experience on mobile, you have to ensure that it can consistently render 60 frames throughout the entire uh, playthrough. So the major culprit of some of the rendering leaks that I was having was of course my checkpoints. I may have gone a little overboard adding five entire lights to just one object, a neat workaround that I found uh, was just to take a screenshot of the 2D light system and then using a plugin in paint.net I could just strip out the black color and leave um, an alpha gradient around the red light. Then importing this as just a sprite, I can increase and decrease the alpha just to have the light fade in and out and it, it really helps performance. So as cool as the 2D light system is in Unity right now, it's just not quite uh, optimized for mobile experience yet. So that's a little unfortunate, but in terms of getting my game to run at an optimal 60 frames per second, I'm willing to make tons of sacrifices right now. Fortunately, I don't have to make it that many because I've been keeping in mind um, performance throughout this entire process. I mean, I've been working with Unity's mobile exporter for around five years now, so I kind of know the ins and outs. Um, every time I've imported a sprite or texture into this game, I've made sure to render it at the lowest possible resolution. But first, as some of you may have heard, um, I won't blame you if you didn't notice this, but the Unity Dark Skin for the editor was just released a few weeks ago. Given this has been something the community has been asking for for years now, there was almost no notice for this release. Literally the only public statement I could find was in the update notes for the 2019.8.4 build under quote-unquote editor improvements. It says, dark theme editor preference is now available to all users. So I backed up my game and tried out this new version of Unity, and I have to say this is a significant improvement. I will not be going back to light theme. As you can see, there's not much difference between the maximum render size and uh, the import render size is the limit for um, how large an image can show up um, in the Unity renderer system. And so the higher this is, the more you can zoom into it and it won't be blurry or pixelated. Of course, for many of my images, they're going to remain small, for instance, like the fly. And so I can even get away with rendering this at as low as 64 by 64 pixels. And so what I often do is when I import a new sprite, I'll try importing it first at a size of 32 by 32, and then slowly increase that import size until I find something that looks passable. Uh, the lower this number is, of course, the less memory the game has to spend in order to read the texture and then display it on screen. And this actually allowed me to create a very poor blurring effect um, that I've been using for my background textures. As I've iterated before, just to really separate them from any foreground objects. Unity's uh, import texture system can either just import raw textures, which is called point, and uh, those look very blocky and pixelated, 
or it can filter them through a bilinear filter, which just kind of blurs the pixels together a bit. A trilinear is another filter, and that blurs mitmaps on top of a bilinear filter, um, but since I use mitmaps pretty sparingly, I've just opted to stick with bilinear. Either way, uh, with this built-in blurring system, the lower the resolution, the more uh, blurry a texture looks, albeit in very low quality. Um, granted, at their small size, way off in the background, most of these background textures are hardly noticeable, um, and just having that tinge of blur kind of helps them fade into the background. Next, because I had just added all of my sounds in the previous video, I got to work researching Unity's importing tools for audio. But first, all of this optimization is kind of making me work up an appetite, so I'm gonna make a sandwich. Over the past couple of months, I've been really paying attention to my diet and trying to lose uh, some body fat while maintaining lean muscle mass. So I've just been watching which foods I eat, how much physical activity I'm getting, and trying to eat low calorie dense foods. But regardless, now that we have that settled, I found this really great blog on medium.com, which I'll link down below. It sort of just covers brief audio compression formats. Unity has three major compression formats. Uh, it's PCM, ADPCM, and Forbis. PCM is short for Pulse Code Modulation. Now PCM is a lossless compression format, which basically means that it doesn't really compress uh, the audio. This means that it's great for audio quality, however, it retains its original size, so it's extremely big, and this just increases the size of the build. However, it requires almost no CPU processing, um, because there's no decompression system. Then we get to ADPCM, and this stands for Adaptive Differential PCM. Now, unlike PCM, this is actually a compression format, and it compresses uh, sounds to around three to four times uh, smaller than the original PCM audio. So unfortunately, with ADPCM, uh, when the sounds are uncompressed, there's a bit of what's called quantization distortion, which essentially means that there's extra noise that fills in the gaps within the audio file. Now this doesn't always happen with every audio file that goes through ADPCM compression, but it is something to be aware of um, for sounds, especially those that contain a lot of high frequency content throughout the entire piece. Finally, we land on Vorbis compression. Now, Vorbis is a fully open, non-proprietary, patent and royalty-free general purpose audio format. Headed by the ziff.org foundation, this project essentially allows anyone to edit it and use it for whatever sort of lossy audio compression that they need. Within Unity's editor in particular, there's the extra axis of a quality slider. Now, again, with any decompression format, this requires significantly higher CPU resources to decompress audio for playback, at the advantage of being able to store these audio sounds at sometimes around 98% decrease in memory. Unity, again, offers three different types of loading. There's compressed in memory, streaming, and decompressed on load. For most of my music and ambient sounds that play throughout the entire level um, and repeat, I use type streaming and compression format Vorbis. For any frequently short audio clips like the, the jumping or like T-Bot steps, I used decompress on load and PCM as the compression format. For less frequently played sounds, um, you can get away with using compressed in memory and ADPCM. And this is because the decompression algorithm also does not consume as much CPU as Vorbis. Since these sounds aren't as much of a priority, I don't want to spend as much memory storing these in the RAM. So after this, optimization gets a little bit more gritty for me because I start needing to use Unity's profiler. This tool, while usually within the editor itself, can actually profile on standalone builds as well as on actual target devices. Uh, so I set up my Android ADB tools to verify my phone's connection to the computer in a command terminal, and then I just built my game directly onto the device using the build and run option right here. This lets Unity know to profile the, on the connected device rather than within the editor, which we can then choose to view in the profile window by choosing Android device. Unfortunately, there are still some spikes up to 30 frames per second, which causes this jittering effect. 
I tried to adjust the V-Sync settings, which stands for vertical sync. You'll often see this option for higher end video games, um, which when enabled, just make sure the game is updating at the same refresh rate as your monitor. So you don't end up with screen tearing, where a new frame is rendered halfway through the monitor's refresh. To do this, the game will stall the frame update until the screen has finished uh, refreshing, which causes these blocks here in the profiler that say wait for target FPS. At a couple of milliseconds each, I thought this may be the issue. Weirdly, I found my game looks best when I run with the following settings, leaving the target frame rate at 120 FPS and V-Sync on Don't Sync. Mobile devices have a mandatory vertical synchronization when rendering is applied at either 30 FPS or 60 FPS anyway, and so instead of applying another vertical sync underneath this, um, I think the game runs a lot smoother by just letting the mobile device handle this synchronization. Now, having fixed most of the major performance concerns I had regarding my game, I tested it directly on my phone again and found it to run very consistently at 60 frames per second. So I called it a day, or well a week, or well two weeks I guess. In all, optimization is probably the second worst part about making games, second after finishing of course. For now, I'm going to see how well I can balance school in this project. I'll still only post every other week, but on the off chance I get more work done, I won't be opposed to posting more often. That's all I have for now, and if you want to support me, leave a like and subscribe so you can stay updated on my progress. And Thanks again for watching, and I'll see you next time.